give you a brief history of humans and automation, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more how that relates to the kind of research that I do in my lab. And I think one of the most important things you need to understand about my lab at Duke is that it is a lab that reaches out across all students, meaning I have probably more undergraduate freshmen uh, in my lab than probably any other lab. So we have a lot of undergraduate research opportunities in my lab, as well as for masters and PhD students. So turn of the century, there was a big debate whether or not the horseless carriage would ever take over the horse and carriage. History, you now know what happens. But this, for those of you who weren't around then, which is nobody uh, probably, it, it was a very heated debate as to whether or not the car would actually become a commonplace technology. And a few years later than that, elevators became a hotly dis disputed topic, whether or not we would need a human inside to operate the elevator. And in fact, in Chicago and a couple other cities in the country, you can still get on elevators that require an operator. But even closer to home, for those of you who know anything about the financial engineering world, trading is done almost all by computers now. And so everywhere that we see in our lives, we're starting to see more and more automation. And even here, fighter pilots are about to become dinosaurs for drones, for example. But why does that matter? That's because that's what I used to do. Before I became a professor, I actually was a pilot for the Navy and I flew A4s and F-18s, what you're seeing up here in the picture. And I, I have landed on aircraft carriers and that was actually the experience that made me leave the military and go into academia because I saw how quickly automation was taking over. On the aircraft carrier, when you take off on the aircraft carrier, as the pilot, you have to show everybody on this side I'm not touching anything, and you have to show everybody on this side, I'm not touching anything, and then you put your hands on these handlebars, and then they shoot you off the catapult, and you are not allowed to touch a thing. That is because the human will only screw it up, and the automation is so much better than the pilot. So that started to make me feel a little nervous, and at the same time, this, you see this missile being shot out of the water. At the same time, um, in another part of the Navy, the submarine Navy, they were learning how to shoot targets from over a thousand miles from their intended target using these tricky missiles that were highly automated. You shot them and they were gone. And they were very, very precise, much more precise than human. And so I started to get this deeply nagging suspicion that my job was going to be over. And in fact, about a year and a half ago, we reached a landmark in this country in that it is now safer to send drones on fighter bomber missions than it is human manned missions. Good thing I jumped. And I jumped and I created the Humans and Autonomy Lab. But my research has a very specific name to it. It's called human supervisory control. It's where a human, on some end, is remotely trying to do some task, in this case, fly a drone. But there's really a computer in the middle that's doing all the, all the heavy lifting. But the human still has to understand how to coach the computer to what um, he or she wants the system to do. Related projects that we work on in my lab are, this is an autonomous forklift, so for, it's for the Army, who needs to go into the field and create warehouses where nothing else has created and they have to be able to drive on mud and sand and rocky surfaces. And so how the human actually works with the robot is a big part of what I do. In fact, this is another related project for uh, mining. You can actually see, this is one of my students. He's in the yellow shirt next to the tire. Do you see how small he is? These robotic dump trucks are huge, and they are completely robots. But still, humans have to be able to control them. And so where I sit on this loop is really looking at how the human controls displays and the computer should be designed to make these systems happen. Near and dear to your own hearts, though, medical technology is starting to become what we call supervisory control technology. This is a tumor ablation device coming out of Israel where you kind of go in like a CAT scan or a PET scan and the computer margins the tumor, figures out all the dosage and the radiologist just pushes a button and the tumor goes away. But even closer to your own hearts is the driverless car. This is the Google car, but there are other companies coming along with the driverless car and I do do research in my lab with Google X because we're concerned about how humans are gonna work with driverless cars of the future, which are definitely coming. So I want to tell you a little bit about some projects that I have done and then some projects that are up and coming in my lab. Uh, I was at, actually at MIT before I came here, uh, and I just recently moved to Duke. So uh, this was a project that we did at MIT where we 
I uh, tried to show everyone just how much you did not need a pilot. So with uh, an iPhone interface that uh, some students basically designed in about four weeks, we showed that you could only, you only needed three minutes of training and then you could successfully fly one. And by successfully fly one, what we had is, you can see the drone up in the picture, and we went to Arizona, this is in January, because you don't do any flying in Boston in January. Uh, this person doesn't know where the field is, doesn't know where the drone is, hasn't seen the drone, hasn't seen the field. We just give them the iPhone interface, and assuming they have some basic smartphone skills, in three minutes or less, they were able to actually fly it in a remote location and do things like you'll see in this upper picture. They were able to, given some general guidelines, go over to this goalpost and see the picture that's on the goalpost, and then they had to pick that person out from a lineup later. So these are the kind of projects, particularly that the younger students do in my lab, where we actually get hands-on technology. My lab right now, for you to walk over to the building, it's just right around the corner. It looks like a drone graveyard because we crash them way more than we fly them. And so we're always uh, interested for students who like to fly and crash things. A new effort that's related to that is, uh, so now that we've actually shown that it's super easy to fly one of these things and you don't, do, don't need two years of flight school to qualify, we're trying to actually reach out now and apply this in settings that would otherwise not be able to have these technologies. So, uh, one area we're working is with the medical technology company here, BD Technologies. We're trying to figure out how to use drones to get uh, medical supplies or just basic supplies into Ebola ravaged areas. You can imagine that's a really good application of drones to send them into dangerous places that nobody really wants to fly. We're also trying to work with the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Kenya because we're trying to make, we're trying to develop technology that is so easy to use that any ranger and any reserve or preserve anywhere around the world could use this technology. So we're trying to get a commercial off-the-shelf, easy-to-use system for anyone who needs to track wildlife. We're also working on this problem. So this is a picture of your, our national airspace system at about 5 o'clock uh, on any given day. The little white lights show you where all the planes are in the world. It's very congested. These are manned flights. There's a big push right now by Amazon for example, but other companies, Google as well, to start doing delivery of not just medical supplies, but your Amazon Air Prime, whatever it is you're ordering at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I know I'm not the only one shopping at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how are we gonna do that? How are you gonna take potentially thousands of drones, very small ones, and insert them into this national airspace and keep all the passenger flights as well as the cargo flights, the big cargo flights safe, and ultimately, all that is going to push us towards the Jetsons age. So there will be a time when the driverless car, which is a ground-based drone, meets the flying drone. And uh, one of the projects I'm working on is trying to push forwards to the idea that well, you will have your own flying car. It sounds futuristic, but the technology is actually all there. What we need to do now is figure out the systems integration aspects. And the last project I'm going to tell you about is that driverless car project that I told you about that I was working with Google. So one of the problems that we have in driverless cars, but we also have it in aviation today, is boredom. It's actually really, really boring to fly a commercial airliner. And when I left the military, that's one of the reasons I went into academia and not Delta, is because it's just painstakingly boring. As you can see, this is a guy uh, asleep uh, with something called the nap strap holding his head back. But we also worry about this in driverless cars. In fact, we worry about it a lot more in driverless cars because it's going to be very, very easy for you if you're doing a long highway drive in your car and it, the, the car is driving itself for a long period of time for you to fall asleep, text, watch movies. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can be distracted if your car is doing a good job of driving itself. But, but how good does it need to be to actually guarantee safety? So one of the issues that we're looking at here is under low workload conditions, meaning those long highway driving conditions, we're putting what's called a functional near-infrared spectroscopy. It basically measures the blood oxygenation in your prefrontal cortex. So we're putting that on your brain so we can find out whether or not there's a time and place that we can sense that you're cognitively disengaged and you could not respond in the time frame that we're going to need you to respond if something crosses the road in front of you, if a car suddenly breaks in front of you. So we're trying to figure out how to do real-time actuation of these driverless car systems so the car can at least pull itself over if it detects that you're not paying attention. So now that we have a little bit more time, I'm gonna tell you what the problems are. 
um, and, and with some of the issues that we're looking at. So this is something called the role allocation debate. So when we actually go to sit down with and design a system that has some level of automation inside the system, the issue is how much automation should be turned over to the computers and how much should be taken on by the humans. And so this is a, a problem that's been around for a long time. This is an, a cartoon that came out of a place called the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, which then became Draper Laboratory. These are the people who did the Apollo space missions. So that was in the 1950s. And what you're seeing on the upper left is that uh, these are astronauts. The question that NASA had was, should the astronauts be sitting around smoking and hanging out with a big abort button? Which, for those of you, I mean, you have to laugh because in the 50s, it was cool to smoke. And in fact, they actually thought there were good health benefits. So you're seeing reflective of that time. Or NASA's question was, well, should we keep them really busy having to do a lot of various different activities? So it's 60 years later, and we have many more um, space missions, but we're still not exactly sure what to do about this. If you, I've actually worked with several of the astronauts, and of course, they want to be more hands-on. They want to do more activities, but it's kind of like the hands left, hands right on the aircraft carrier. There's actually some activities that people should never do. Uh, an example in your everyday life would be nuclear power plants. The reason that those are highly automated are there's something in you called the neuromuscular lag. Every human in them has, built in, has a built-in half second, about a half second delay, in that you see something and then you, it, it actually you know, it goes into your brain, you understand it, then you tell your muscles to do something and you hit a button. In nuclear reactors, even that half second can cause a reactor to go too critical too quickly, so that's why they automate many of those processes. So humans, the question is, but other than understanding where the neuromuscular lag is, what other design criteria do we have? Now, if you ask the world of roboticists, and, and they'll be, um, they're all over the place, ground, air, um, whatever, this is how they see the human. They see that they want to build the world with all robots, and then the human is under glass, only to be called upon in emergencies. Uh, and I would tell you both of these visions are actually not right because they, what they both do is they both kind of take a mutually exclusive approach as, as opposed to what the human should or shouldn't be doing. So when I actually go out into the world and I work with various companies um, uh, and, and when you see me coming, basically it means, you know, maybe somebody might be losing a job, but, but where? I mean, like, where? How do we know what jobs are going to go over to robots and how do we know what jobs are going to stay with people? And so I, what I have proposed, that how people think about this, is something called the skills, rules, knowledge-based taxonomy. This was an uh, original taxonomy, was, came out of um, Denmark, a researcher named Jens Rasmussen, who basically said there's three ways that people process information in the world. You have skill-based reasoning, and in this case, you're seeing a cockpit. This is actually where pilots learn to keep the aircraft level, uh, you know, uh, on airspeed, on altitude on the right heading. And it takes a lot of skill, a lot of monkey practice to do that. Then once you actually master the ability to keep the air, air, aircraft in flight, then you move up to rule-based knowledge, which you can think of as procedures. If this condition happens, then I'm going to change the aircraft status in this way. If the air traffic control tells me to, to descend um, to flight level 180, I'm going to pull the power back, I'm going to push the nose down. It's very procedurally driven. And then what we have is knowledge-based reasoning. If there's maybe two different problems happening at the same time that isn't exactly covered by procedure, then I'm going to have to figure out how to integrate these procedures. And then one step further above that is expertise. I added expertise to this framework because it's, it's good that you have knowledge about, deep knowledge about a certain task, and a pilot with only five years of training can have very deep knowledge, for example, about a system. But a pilot who has only been flying for many, many years, who has seen many, many different sets of conditions, can actually truly have what we call expertise. Also, because I'm getting older, I felt like it, it felt good to me to add a layer that young people cannot have in this framework. So it, it helps me justify to myself that, um, you know, you have to be old, at least older, to get experience. But one good example of that is Miracle on the Hudson. So Chesley Sullenberger, you know, he had the, the flame out of the engines due to the bird strike. 
it, it, this was, there were some procedures that covered ditching, there were some procedures that covered the bird strike, but altogether it was a situation that was fraught with uncertainty, and that's the axis that you're seeing on the right, which is an, another addition by me. Uncertainty is the key driver here. The more uncertain a, a system is and a situation is, the more you're going to need humans, and that's why you see this balance right here. So in the world, we actually see that computers are actually really good at skill-based reasoning. This is why for example, the, the missions for the military, the fighter-bomber missions, are more safely done by computers right now because they require a lot of skill and very rigid rule-based following. So we're able to automate that pretty well. Now what we can automate in those strike missions though are firing a missile to kill another human. We do not automate that in this country. And that's because that requires both knowledge and a level of expertise that we simply cannot pass on to computers right now. Computer vision, and you may hear about that later from Guillermo, is getting better, but it's not at the level of resolution for life and death decisions at this point in time. And so for now, humans really, we, we reign supreme in the knowledge and expertise area, and computers are really down at the skills and rules. And so the question about system design in the future, for example, the Google car. Cars are actually better breakers. When they see an impending collision, they can actually get on the brakes way faster than you can and they can modulate the brakes just perfectly for optimal braking, much better than a human can. But it's that classic problem in driver's ed, when the ball rolls out into the street in front of the computer, the computer yet cannot capture the fact that there may be kids around and where would the kids be coming and that a kid might be coming. So it's basically this prediction into the future based on limited information that you have in the world around you. That's really where computers do not do a good job. So when you come into my lab, this is kind of the framework that we take when we start to look at systems. And we've looked at other systems like, for example, high-speed rail. High-speed rail is a great candidate for automation at skills and rules, and, and, we, and the uncertainty is very low. You're on a track, and unless you're going too fast, you're not going to get off that track. And by the way, we still have train derailments around the world, and they're almost always caused by what? Human error, humans distracted, and as of late, um, it's almost always humans texting. By the way, you know what one of the biggest problems in aviation right now is? It just cracks me up. Pilots. Pilots texting while taxiing. Are you serious? I'm like, you can't even stay off your texting button while you're taxiing an aircraft, right? So the FAA recently had to come down on pilots to tell them to quit texting while taxiing. And, and I poke fun at them, but, but this, is, this is part of the human condition. We live in a completely different world where we're addicted to information and we need to start understanding how to design systems to help balance our addictions and our uh, you know, our desire, we love to be distracted, as well as the need to be able to operate a complex critical systems safely. Okay, so that was a really quick and dirty review of my lab. You can go to my lab website here. Um, if you Google me, you will find an inordinate number of media, um, The Daily Show, Colbert Report, you know, I'm out there. Uh, we have a really fun lab, and like I said, we have great undergraduate research opportunities. And with that, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. I'm not scary. It's okay to ask a question. Even parents can ask questions. Oh, everybody. Oh, there's one right there. So what are your former Navy uh, compatriots thinking about your switch to the drone model? That's a great question. Um, I'm generally seen as a Benedict Arnold of my field because um, pilots are holding on really tightly to the fact that uh, they are critical to the system. And what's sad is that they don't really realize they are. We still need pilots to basically sit back and call the quarterback shots but you don't need the pilot in the cockpit to actually do the takeoff and landings, for example, and certainly not for the um, very dangerous missions. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I get a lot of emails late at night, angry emails. How could you do this? And then I send them the picture of the horseless carriage. No, I don't. That would just make it worse. Okay, another question. So it sounds like um, a lot of the work that you're doing is going to require a lot of That's right, that's a great observation. So my research sits at the intersection of psychology and technology. We're an engineering lab, so we are technologists, but 
Uh, I do require my students to take some psychology classes, and so if you don't like people, which a lot of engineers actually, you know, they're not that crazy about people. You, it's, my lab is probably not for you, but you'll find that I find that, and this is actually one of the reasons I came to Duke, is because Duke is a school that is uh, a lot more humanistic. And so I think that you'll find at Duke a large population of students who actually care about humans and care about how the technology is being used in the real world. In the orange, yep. Do you know what the, uh, the upcoming model for drones uh, is going to be in terms of delivery via Amazon? And is there a, is there a thinking as how they're going to integrate that into uh, you know, the current air traffic? Well, that's why we're doing that research project um, that we're working on, which is actually coming up with some prototype designs of what that airspace integration problem might look like. I will tell you that, that while the technology is here, one of the showstoppers potentially for the drone integration problem for Amazon and other delivery companies, it's actually not the airspace control problem as much as it is the in-game solution. So I have a seven-year-old, and if a drone landed outside my front door, she would totally try to grab it. Um, and she's not malicious. And so one of the issues that we're really struggling with right now is how do you make sure that small lightweight drones are not somehow compromised, um, particularly as they're delivering potentially a diamond ring. I don't recommend that. Um, uh, but so there are, there are some real issues that really, and this is why speaking to the other question, why it's so important to look at the socio-technical fabric of a problem because what ultimately the ultimate issues that Amazon is going to face are not really technical, they're socio-technical. As I was thinking, the, the corridors that could be used, you could follow roads and streets, for instance. You know, but that seven-year-old situation. Yeah, and that seven-year-old's not even trying to, to capture it, right? So we've got a lot of issues, but they're, but they're interesting, and that's the kind of problems that engineers solve. How about the privacy issue? So we could be here all day, and in fact, if you go on the internet, you'll see me talk a lot about privacy issues. There are privacy concerns, and certainly, uh, but most cameras on drones do not actually, do not have the capability to do the pinpoint um, spying accuracy that you think they will. They're not, uh, drones today use cameras for navigation, so they're basically <coughs> tracking the ground beneath them and trying to figure out where they are. So they're actually looking at different features. They're not necessarily looking at people. Now the military drones, and, and I understand that there's concerns with local law enforcement, drones that just hover overhead with big fancy cameras on them, that is their job. And I do think that it's important for state legislatures to engage um, on those uh, issues. But I will actually tell you the, the most problem across the country is the drone paranoia, it, it's, in the wrong, it's focused on the wrong thing. It's focused on the actual platform and not the camera on the platform. The Google car, for example, has far more cameras on it and will be far more intrusive to your privacy. Uh, because it has cameras that look out around the world at other drivers. It also has cameras that, in, that look in at you as a driver. So I think as a society that we need to think more about this broader issue of electronic surveillance, whether or not we're talking about cameras on drones, on cars, uh, in stores that you're in, because they're a lot more prevalent today and in places that you might not expect them. Yeah, so I, I'm assuming that on a computer side you're talking about more SCADA systems and how far to the right um, or my right, can you go with expert systems uh, as far as going in more into human space? This is well, so this is, uh, so first of all, SCADA systems are supervisory control systems. They're things like power plants, um, you know, anywhere where you see these complex levels of automation. And it's kind of a misnomer to say expert systems. When you hear people talk about expert systems in the world today, what they're really talking about are effectively rule-based systems. That we've been able to codify a set of rules to some degree that we know uh, how much, um, uh, you know, we can, we can sense the world to a high degree of certainty and we have a good if-then-else rubric to follow along. So when you say how far can we push that, I, I would actually tell you that we need to be mindful of, of, you know, don't be like that roboticist picture that just wants to put the human behind glass. It's not a mutually exclusive approach. It's a way to try to combine the human together. So a good example of this is, this is a, 
uh, basically a video game. By the way, if you're in my lab, we do a lot of video game playing uh, and design because this is effectively what the world has, has come down to. So this is a, an interface that allows you to control multiple um, drones at the same time. I won't, you, you, if you want to go to my website, you can read all the papers about it. But one of the things that we found out is we were looking at this role balancing problem. We were trying to figure out who is better at what. And what we did is we let the automation, basically you have to try to find a target, then you track the target, then you neutralize the target. And so one of the things that we found in the system was that humans were really, really superior at finding the target, but the automation was better at tracking the target, um, and then the humans were left to do the neutralization. But it's, it, that's a bit of a misnomer because there is actually no way one person could control multiple drones at the same time without a lot of automation. And so when we say that humans were superior at search, what we mean is humans were superior at guiding the automation to do search. Now what you're seeing here in this graph, the x-axis is um, a time interval which represents how hard it was the 30 represents high workload and the 120 um, represents low workload. And then the y-axis shows you how many targets were found in this world. Now the, the dash lines were if you let the automation do the work by itself, that's how many targets would have been found. And then the solid lines above it show you how many targets would have been found if the human coaches the automation. So this is really more of a collaborative experience, not one where one is replacing the other. So there's no question in these results that the human guiding the automation was a far superior system. What's really, I think, interesting about this graph is this, was a gra this whole experiment came out of a bet because I was working with some of the DARPA Grand Challenge roboticists at MIT who really hate humans and did not think that humans could do a good job here. And so we, I basically bet them that if we harness their very clever algorithms, um, that their algorithms could not do a better job than if my humans would coach their algorithms. And so this was an arm wrestling match because when the first set of results came out, the professor didn't believe it. And then we had to repeat it and then he believed it. And in fact, he turned into a big supporter of this kind of research, and then we went on to publish some um, very um, widely cited articles about this. So it's an important, I think this experiment but kind of shows you those role allocation issues, but it also shows you a broader cultural pushback. We humans, we love to believe that we can just offload some things to automation. Not all of us, but a lot of us would like to just hand over our cognitive resources to our iPhone. I'm the worst. But at the same time, we need to realize that there are some limits as to what automation can do, and we really need to look at this as at this joint space of how do we bring people together. Okay. More extra lecturing that you never thought that you would have. All right, I can take one time for one question, and then we're going to switch over. Thank you. Um, you triggered one of my greatest fears in life. Um, when you talk about texting, are, are you working on an engineering sort of approach to minimizing texting while driving out on our nation's <laughs> Um Yeah, I mean, if, if I had, as a researcher, if I had my way, your texting device would be disabled in your car until we get the whole world um, in a network driverless car situation and then I let you text to your heart's content. Um, you know, that has been proposed, but, you know, that's actually, you as a voter would probably vote that down, right? So this is, it's, it, it is a tricky balance between knowing what people's behaviors really are and then trying to design the technology to do that. So the, this actually falls more into the policy camp. So how can we actually then now put regulations in place, particularly in terms of developing cars? So, so for example, cars are all going to come out with automated braking very soon. Automated braking collision avoidance, right? That's coming in 2018. So hopefully um, those kinds of inter technology interventions will help mitigate the texting disaster.